Good morning, everybody, to this happy uh, uh, Taylor and Francis webinar on uh, open access and research and getting the fruits of uh, all our wonderful research uh, in front of more people, policymakers, um, and, and indeed people across uh, society. So um, we've got, uh, it's only going to be an hour long, so we're going to cram a lot into the hour. Um, and first, we're going to hear from uh, Vicky Gardner, our uh, colleague at Taylor and Francis, um, who uh, is she's head of policy there. And she's co-author of a report that Happy and Taylor and Francis did jointly in December on the very issues uh, that we're under discussion this morning. And this webinar really tops off uh, six months of work between our two organisations, which have included lots of blogs, one or two private events. And we really wanted to end it with this uh, this public event. Um, and after Vicky, uh, we will hear from Sarah Chater, who's Director of Research Strategy and Policy uh, and Joint Chief of Staff at UCL, University College uh, London. Uh, then we'll hear, uh, uh, Sarah will pass to Stephen Hill, uh, Director of Research at Research England. Many of you will uh, already know him. And Stephen will pass over to Tracy Brown for her introductory remarks. And Tracy is director at, at Sense About Science. So each of our speakers will speak for five minutes or thereabouts. And then the second half of the webinar will be an opportunity for you to put your questions to uh, all four of them. Uh, please do use the Q&A down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll keep the chat for any tech techie problems. Uh, do use the Q&A and I'll be monitoring those and, and and we'll even get you maybe to turn on your gate. We'll turn on your mics and put your own questions to our, our speakers. So thank you for attending. We've had fantastic take up of this session, which I think shows the level of interest uh, in this topic. And uh, with no further ado, uh, I'm going to turn over to Vicky from Taylor and Francis. Thank you very much, Nick, for the warm introduction and delighted to be here with such a fantastic panel. Um, huge thanks to Nick and the HEPI team for convening this discussion and, of course, a warm welcome to everyone listening in. So, Emma, um, if you could share the slides. I do have slides, only two. You may be pleased to hear. But I'd like to use these to do some scene setting and provide a brief overview of the HEPI and TNF policy note. So as Nick mentioned, this note was based on about six months worth of work, um, really the pinnacle of which was a dinner discussion last year. And this brought together representatives from academia, higher education, government, funders, industry, advocacy organizations, and publishers, of which TNF is one. So we asked the delegates to think about a world where all research was openly available, and to discuss whether in this world evidence-based policy making would be the norm. This framing allowed us to move beyond the topic of open access to research, although it is vitally important of course, but what we wanted to do with this framing was to focus on what other challenges might remain in terms of making research more accessible, more usable and more impactful within and beyond academia, with focus on the groups that you can see on the right of the slide. So it was a really rich and multifaceted discussion, which we've tried to do justice to in the note. There was certainly consensus amongst the group that open access would help to make research more beneficial, but that other challenges remain. And you can see some of the key ones briefly summarised here. So these included the sheer volume of the research corpus itself, which makes engagement challenging for those potential users who are short of time and often working to deadlines. Additionally, the language, the terminology, and sometimes the formats used within specific dis disciplines, often these are employed as shorthand, but it can make participation challenging for those outside of that discipline or field. And a final reflection around the lack of incentives for academia to engage through their research with broader audiences. So that's a little bit on the challenges, but moving on to the next slide, what I really want to spend my remaining time doing is to focus on the heart of the policy note, which was the approach that was suggested to help address these, challenging, these challenges. This was a framework consisting of five components or five C's, and I must give a huge amount of credit and a hat tip to Sarah Chater at UCL. She joins us today and she actually proposed this outline framework at the dinner and has since built on this in an excellent blog, so I'm sure she'll expand on this further. 
I found this framework incredibly helpful personally in terms of thinking about how we move forward from ideas to practice. So what I want to do is briefly elaborate each element, and I do apologise, Sarah, for any misinterpretation. But a, a couple of overarching themes that have sprung out to me. Um, one of them is perhaps around people, so a theme of supporting mobility, building skills, building capacity. And perhaps a, a second theme or a second track is around place, so a focus on bringing together different groups in different contexts. So let's move on to the five C's. Firstly, we have capabilities, and Sarah's talked about these in terms of translational, relational and curational. As a publisher, um, I'd like to focus on translational capability, which is about making research comprehensible to a non-specialist. So the example we have here is training researchers on public engagement. Um, an example might be how to write effective policy briefs, which helps in the research to policy interface, and it's something that UCL does very well. Connections covers building long term relationships with inherent trust between parties, and this is about supporting the transfer and the application of insights. The example we have is UK Parliament, which is rolling out thematic research leads this year. The intention is that these roles will be taken up by researchers with an aim of supporting knowledge exchange by providing and synthesizing evidence to support with decision making. Coordination, our third key, uh, our third C, beg your pardon, is about grouping people as well as outputs. So the example we have here is around placing academics in, in industry. And this context brings together those doing the research with those applying it, and perhaps helps to bridge the gap between research, applied research and practice. Collaboration is about facilitating interactions by actively moving away from perhaps the established traditions, rules and structures of individual groups. We've, we've thought here there could be a role for publishers or perhaps other knowledge brokers in creating new spaces for cross-sectoral knowledge exchange. Our last C is around co-production. So here this is any or all of academics, policymakers, businesses and civil society working together to design, to investigate and to communicate the outcomes of research. Tracy Brown at Sense About Science, who joins us today, has talked about creating testable research questions which could translate into real world application and benefit. I think we're all familiar with this application in the healthcare and the clinical medicine context, but there's also wider citizen science projects, citizens assemblies and other initiatives where I think there are compelling examples of where this co-production activity is already happening. You'll notice I've, I've got a final couple of bullets here. I've taken the liberty of suggesting two other elements for reflection. So perhaps there's, there's a, a, an additional C around consensus or agreement on the key problem to be addressed and how to address it. So is there a greater role here for more accessible formats such as syntheses that would distill the evidence base to outline areas of broad agreement? A final C potentially is around credit. So this is about the rewards and incentive structures that that challenge that I mentioned before, how can these be calibrated to support the elements above? Now there's lots already happening in this sphere, UKRI is doing a great deal of work on research culture and reform, and maybe this is something that we can pick up with Stephen from Research England. One final reflection, I think that this framework provides really great structure for future cross-sectoral action, and I've also found that it aligns with a lot of broader thinking about the UK research and innovation agenda, around civic engagement, around levelling up, and around other themes. So I can see this having relevance at a macro level, as well as within all of our contexts. That's enough from me, so with that I will hand over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, and thank you for that really interesting presentation. Um, it's lovely to see how you and Laura built on that five C's framework that we discussed at the dinner last year. Um, and thanks to you and, and Happy for inviting me to speak on a topic that's very dear to my heart. So I really wanted to focus on the importance of research evidence informing public policy making. Um, and I think this is in the context of an increasing focus on that 
seen amongst universities who are looking at ways of building deeper links with public policy stakeholders, research funders who we see, including Research England, who we see um, introducing new initiatives to support that engagement, um, and also an increased appetite and demand from policymakers for research and academic evidence. But despite that increased focus and attention, which is really welcome, I think it's still the case that evidence-informed policy isn't an everyday reality. So what I wanted to do today was just um, reflect briefly on three challenges uh, and think about some of the experience I've had with two projects, Capabilities and Academic Policy Engagement and IPO, um, the International Public Policy Observatory, and think about how we might move further towards getting evidence-informed policy part of that everyday reality. So the first challenge I wanted to think about was, was knowledge production. Um, and this is not to say that the production of knowledge for its own sake is not the most valuable thing, because I think that is the most valuable thing about the research endeavour. But it is to say that when we have a publicly funded research base, I think we do need to think about how it can help to address crucial societal challenges. And reflecting on why open access may not be enough, which is the title we're considering today, does prompt consideration, I think, of whether enough research is addressing public policy needs. By which I mean, do researchers have sufficient understanding of the public policy landscape? Do they have visibility of some of the policy questions that actors are grappling with? And do they understand what sort of knowledge might be most valuable to policymakers when they're making decisions? Vicky's already mentioned evidence synthesis, and I think there's a bit of a paradox here because it's something that we know is highly valued by policymakers, but really undervalued by academia. Um, and as Vicky said, creating more incentives for the kind of research and the kind of synthesis that we know is useful for policy is something that perhaps we need to consider. I think there's a real challenge still for academia to understand how we can better embed public policy concerns into the research endeavour and how we can respond to them whilst, of course, preserving academic freedom and the pursuit of curiosity. So there's a balance to be struck, um, but I don't think we've yet got it right. And that takes me to a second challenge, which is around knowledge curation. We know that there is a huge volume, as Vicky has mentioned, of just sheer stuff knowledge. Um, and there are real challenges for audiences outside of academia, and particularly policy audiences who are often strapped for time in navigating and understanding that volume of knowledge. Understanding what the evidence base actually is, but also what the implications of it for policy decisions. And that's where the capabilities that, that Vicky has mentioned from the, the five C's framework come in. That there's a real need still for translational capabilities to make research that's often very technical and very complex, much more comprehensible. But I think there's also a need for curation of different disciplinary knowledge, recognizing that we need cross-disciplinary insights to address many of the crucial public policy challenges we face. So thinking about how we bring those together and how we curate them in a way that makes them much more accessible and digestible for public policy. And related to that, we need better coordination of knowledge and expertise. So bringing people together through advisory networks, bringing people together in forms and in groups where policymakers know how to reach them. I think this is particularly important when we're thinking about short term policy needs, which demand a pretty urgent response. So really what we need to think about is what's already known and how best can that be communicated. So something that IPO, the International Public Policy Observatory, is working on at the moment is iterating the supply of knowledge with policy demand with different policy stakeholders across the UK to help shape systematic review questions that can hopefully help to address some of the key policy needs that they have. Similarly, CAPE is currently testing rapid reviews of evidence, working with the UK Parliament to address questions that select committees and others have posed. And that leads me to the third challenge, and in some ways I think the most important or perhaps the most overlooked, which is about knowledge mobilisation, by which I mean how we create the connectivity, the connections, the glue between the knowledge base and evidence demand. And I think this is fundamentally about people. So it's those relational capabilities that Vicky's mentioned. It's about building trust. It's about establishing sustainable networks. It's also about ensuring that those networks are diverse, that they're inclusive, um, and that they are sustainable for the long term. Policymaking is rapid and unpredictable, as we all know. So making sure that we've got enough of the right place, right time opportunities for evidence to be used in policy is really crucial. 
I think knowledge mobilisation also needs to think much more deeply about how the evidence base can be used in policy making very practically. It's not enough just to proffer it. We have to work with policy stakers to make it applicable, to make it usable, to make it actionable. Um, Nesta, working with CAPE, has recently produced, um, in fact, co-produced with the Department for Leveling Up Housing um, Communities and Local Government, a toolkit on how to engage with evidence. Um, it's long, but I would urge you all to have a quick look at the summary because it's a really nice example of thinking through in a policy system how evidence can be used and applied. And of course, we know that knowledge mobilisation requires effective collaboration. It's much more effective when it's done multilaterally, not just bilaterally. And that means universities have to get better at working together to mobilise their collective knowledge to inform public policy making. And ultimately, I hope that would lead to greater co-production. And when I think about co-production, I'm thinking both about how future research agendas might be shaped and take better account of policy need, might be developed in conjunction and in partnership with different policy actors and stakeholders, but also how academics could potentially get more involved in co-production of policy. I think bringing a wider range of expertise, academic and in fact other expertise, into policy making is really important. And that probably brings me back to knowledge production and how we can embed greater co-production. So I'll end there and pass to Stephen. Thanks very much, Sarah, and, and thanks to Happy for organising this event and, and for inviting me to speak. It's a delight, I'm delighted to be here this morning. Um, I, I guess my starting point is, is the premise uh, for, for today's uh, seminar is open access enough. And, and I think I'd agree very much with um, the previous speakers and the report that the open access is um, necessary, but not sufficient to enable the um, wider access to research findings that I think we all uh, agree is an important aspect, both of policy making and of, of wider societal benefit from research. Um, I suppose having said that, I, I, you know, just as an aside, I, you know, I, I don't buy into the the, uh, the the kind of assumption, and I don't think that's what what this work is suggesting um, that that there's no one outside of academia who can't possibly you know make sense of of the research literature. So I think I think there are plenty of experts outside of the academic sphere who can interrogate directly uh, research uh, you know, research outputs that are attend intended primarily for academic use. Um, and, and that that includes people in the policy making sphere, but also uh, you know, wider publics, uh, including thing, people like patient groups. I think you can you can uh, definitely find plenty of examples of uh, of patient groups who have a real deep understanding of the research literature that is relevant to their um, their condition or or, um, or issue that they're they're concerned with. Um, but I do think in general, uh, so, you know, some of these barriers and challenges that have been talked about around uh, yeah, accessibility of language and uh, and the sheer volume and scale of research and how that interfaces with the policy world, uh, you know, are real, real and, and true barriers. And perhaps the the kind of notion that that open access might be sufficient to enable um, better evidence informed policy making is based on a kind of false um, assumption about how the interactions between academic research and policy operate in the real world. It's based on a, on a rather linear model where uh, you know the, the academic research is just ge about generating this codified knowledge that again, then gets you know, lobbed into the policy making world and miraculously uh, turns into 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 evidence informed policy. And of course, you know, all the evidence suggests that that the, the real world is not absolutely nothing like that, um, that it's a much more iterative process, a much more um, negotiated process between uh, academic research and policy making and policy making is operating on this very different time scale um, and uh, has very different um, parameters around how uh, research findings might be used. It's it's about what's evidence is available now, not uh, what's the perfect answer to the question that we're that we're seeking to address. So so I think all of those things really do mean that um, that uh, that that simply making academic research available through open access is not sufficient to to bring about better uh, evidence informed policy and i think it it's important to emphasize as well for me that this is not just about the language 
that uh, within which uh, academic research is written. Although I think you know we all know that that anyone reading something outside of their their field of their own field of expertise can struggle with the language. But it's partly about the abbreviation of of research communication that um, that. Uh, you know, research, the research literature depends upon, or understanding it depends upon uh, having um, that background knowledge. Uh, many things about the discipline in question are implicit and assumed um, and really not obvious to someone uh, who is coming from, from outside. Um, and I think that tendency does get exacerbated um, by um, by some of the constraints that are put on uh, on on research publishing, um, things like word limits and page limits, which, to be honest, to me seem a little anachronistic in a world where um, most of uh, almost all consumption of the research literature is done in an electronic format, and yet you know journal policies push people into very very abbreviated forms of of writing um so i think that's that's something that's really worth um worth thinking about in terms of improving accessibility and and i think the the, the most important thing really for me about uh you know the the relationship between the research literature and evidence informed policy making is that you know it's it's never about one journal article or maybe i should uh, rephrase that it's almost never about one journal article it's about um the synthesis of knowledge and that's already been mentioned by sarah and vicky in in their opening comments that that what policy makers need is uh is the balance of evidence they need to understand the diverse views in a particular field that come together and so evidence synthesis uh for me is really really important part of this um, and and moving away from this idea that somehow just by reading a, a single or a small number of um, of, uh, of publications, a policymaker can get the insight that they need to make evidence based policy. Um, so what what to do about this? Well, I think you know we've had lots of good solutions and suggestions from from previous speakers. Um, you know, I might throw a few a few extra ones into the mix. Um, I, I think there is an onus on. Um, uh, on ac academic researchers to actually write in more accessible ways. Um, you know, I think as a user of um, of uh, of, of uh, academic research in policy making, um, you know, I'm often surprised by uh, the convoluted language that can be used to describe things that are actually quite simple and straightforward uh, once you get in inside them. And of course, that's not true in all disciplines, but but I do think that um, that. You know, some focus on on uh, writing in a clearer and more understandable way is important. I mentioned the importance of research syntheses and review articles, and I think we do need to think carefully about how we incentivize those. So I think that's something that's very live for me in thinking about uh, the future of, of our national research assessment is how we make sure that people get the credit they deserve for the enormous effort that goes into producing review articles and, and evidence syntheses. Um, and, uh, you know, there are various ways in which those are currently reflected in the, um, in the, in the REF particularly through the impact element in, in the context of evidence-based policy making. But I do think we, we can do more, and I think changing those incentives are important. I think you know, it's already been mentioned about how this relates to broader initiatives around research culture. And I think uh, you know, the adoption of narrative CVs, for example, um, hopefully gives people space to really um, uh, demonstrate the work they do in the, that policy interface space and uh, and the importance of evidence synthesis in that and and there are a number of initiatives already around the production of plain english plain language policy summaries um, and i think those are really important tools for reaching policymakers. and then the final thing i might mention uh before closing is that we do need to, i think to start um examining the role of technology in this um, you know, I'm not I'm not going to kind of buy into all the hype around AI and natural language processing and, and so on. You know, I think there is a lot of hype, but there is also a lot of potential in that technology and tools like topic modeling, for example, can really help uh, in an automated way um, direct 
people to particular parts of, of the research literature that are relevant to their questions. So I, I do think there's some some real potential there that that needs to be explored a bit more uh, in, in the future in terms of tackling this question. Um, but just to conclude, I think, you know, I I think the, the premise that that open access isn't sufficient is uh, is um, is very clear and I think there are a number of areas that we need to do more work and you know I guess I would emphasize from my perspective the importance of the incentives and really thinking about how we reward the type of work that's needed to um, to to bring the research literature to life for its use in evidence-based policy making so um, I'll conclude there and hand over to Tracy thanks Steve um that was really, um, really a, a very um, uh, mind-blowing set of uh, issues that have been raised by previous speakers. I'm, I'm delighted to um, uh, uh, be part of this conversation. Um, and I will try to stick to what I was going to say uh, and not respond to everything that people have put on, on the agenda. Um, I come at this from the demand side. Um, Sense about science promotes the public interest in sound science and evidence. And what we mean by that is we equip people, and by that I mean um, the public and policymakers and the media to ask good questions. Uh, we work with researchers to help them to answer those questions in uh, uh, appreciable human language. And we work with both to encourage a culture um, and the equipment we need to have a, an open, honest discussion about the research that we're using. And I would say that um, we have to be very careful when we say open access is not enough, there's still stuff to do. That's not a bit of housekeeping that there is still to do. That is the bulk of the job, uh, that we equip people with what I call evidence know-how uh, in order to uh, make sensible use of um, the research base that we have and to think about the kind of research that we should be doing. Um, I think that is the big task. Open access is merely um, a, a question of um, a, a, a small question of, of process within that, um, to my mind. And I think it's about time we started to take stock of what is our societal evidence know-how. Um, there are kind of cre crucial points that I think most of us could begin to name uh, around what is know-how. One I think is very much around the status of findings. So, you know, is it peer-reviewed? That was something that Sense About Science started a campaign on more than a decade ago. Uh, no one actually knew what peer review was then. Um, and now we find that it's pretty standard. Even, you know, most radio show producers know to ask, uh, is this peer-reviewed when they get sent a press release about a study? Um, and it's something that we work with, you know, uh, with various um, government agencies, uh, not just in the UK, but internationally to improve people's questioning of the status of findings. But of course, that goes on to systematic reviews uh, and to look at research synthesis and so on. What is the status of the findings? Are other kinds of research in this field finding the same things? Is this a moving area? Uh, or is it a very settled area of science and so on? We need to have a conversation about the status. Um, then we also need to talk much more about the quality of the work and how well it answers a question. So I don't think it's all just about outreach and promotion and equipping researchers to do better. Uh, although I think all those things are very important and I can never understand why we train researchers to speak in this really uh, rather in, you know, impersonal kind of um, overly passive way, uh, uh, which is just um, impenetrable for a lot of people. Technical language is fine, but I don't understand why we teach them to write in ways that um, no ordinary human speaks. Um, however, I don't think it is just about that. We need to have a conversation about how well research is designed to answer questions, how much of the question it can be answered. Uh, has, you know, we, we need to talk about which parts of the questions we ask as a society are testable and how much of them are about our values and our priorities um, and which questions we want to test. And so I think those are conversations that we should seek to um, empower people with. And that is something that I think is rather strange, uh, strangely missing from a lot of the discussion we have. So we have great preoccupation with a concern with misinformation. 
alongside really um, obscure areas of work that are now really important to policy. So for example, the use of models, the use of data science, you know, when we hosted a discussion with um, at the um, European Commission and invited uh, directors right across the commission to talk about the use of models in policy making and, and the, you know, the research outputs from those models. Um, every single director showed up, which shows you that there is a really um, big appetite out there for more of this equipment, more uh, of what we need to ask about how what should we be looking for uh, in order to see how well research is answering our questions. So there's a lot that needs to be done in this area. I think I pick out data science because I find it amazing that we've got to the point we've got in data science. Um, alongside conversations about public engagement everywhere. Uh, and I think we really need to take a big step back and look at how well equipped is society um, to, to understand research in context uh, and to think about the, you know, the big question, I suppose, is, is can it bear the weight that we want to put on it? And researchers are guides in that process. But <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> We also need to consider how much we're putting on of this on individual researchers, because it's just not realistic. I mean, it'd be wonderful if people write lay summaries uh, and are good at public engagement. And I think we all seek to provide that support for them. We, we run Evidence Week in Parliament, for example. We make sure that researchers are well equipped to do a three minute briefing uh, that goes straight to the heart of the policy question that uh, uh, representatives might be concerned with. However, we really neglect the rest of the research infrastructure. We don't talk enough about curation at a time when we're concerned with misinformation in society. We're not thinking about the libraries and the other uh, kind of gatekeepers to knowledge um, and the roles that they play and how important it is for them to have investment to be, to be able to contribute to the stock uh, of evidence know-how in society. I think we're looking far too much just at the level of the individual researcher and not considering that. I think also publishers, you know, again, open access has meant that we've talked so much about models of uh, business and very little about understanding the role of curation and who has responsibility for that. So whilst we, you know, we're, we're having this discussion, you know, big bodies of data from uh, observational data or online usage and so on are making their way into the public discussion. And nobody's actually talking about what is curated and why uh, elements of that curation are so important for us to understand. So I think there's a lot of work to be done to have this conversation, but ultimately the conversation we're having is, can the material that we've got bear the weight that we want to put on it as a society? Thank you, Tracy. That's fantastic. Um, we're going to uh, uh, thank you to all our speakers. I'm going to go straight into the Q&A because actually there's been a flood of uh, very interesting questions and we had some submitted before the event as well. So um, I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to get people to ask their own questions. And I'm wondering if we can go first to Sarah Huxley. Do say, Sarah, what your institution is. Uh, if, if if you're working in an institution and uh, put your question to the to the panelists. You're still on mute at the moment. Let's see if we can unmute you. No, that's not don't think that's working. So I will read out uh, Sarah's question, um, which is uh, Sarah works at Lincoln University. Um, on something called mobile arts piece. Uh, and her question is, what advice would you give a research project looking to use arts-based and non-conventional methods and research evidence to influence policy? Specifically in her case, uh, it sounds like the national curriculum, um, but non-traditional non uh, research methods. I'm going to take a number of questions before we go back to the panelists. So now I'm gonna go to Mandy Thomas, who's got the most upvoted question in the Q&A. Mandy, good morning. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a question for Sarah, but also the um, other panellists. But Sarah talked specifically about um, co-production. And I just wondered about the um, what you see as the dangers around that kind of approach where policymakers have their own ideological agendas um, and might not actually be interested in the, the evidence-based base or might try to skew it. 
Thank you. So we've had a question on non-traditional uh, research and a question on co-production. Before we go back to the panel, I'm going to go to Martin Hughes, who's asked, he's got three questions in the list. Martin, Martin, I'm not sure we'll have time to put all three questions to the panellists, but we're, 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 what do you most want to ask? And where are you? Where are you from? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, independent. I'm uh, I'm just researching. I'm a big fan of uh, public engagement and universities. Um, let's see. Uh, I th I think uh, that Tracy made some very good points, um, and so I am interested in that. Uh, but my main question, I think, is about policymakers and organisations with exec summary thoughts. Uh, how do we help them to uh, not feel bogged down with the research? but that they can access a greater amount of information and to, uh, and to maybe curate multiple sources uh, so that they can have a top level information. Thank you, Martin. As a director of a think tank, I'm interested in that question as well, because journalists sometimes tell me they only read the exec summary and nothing else. <laughs> I'm sure none of the journalists listening in today do that. But um, let's go back to the panel. I will try and put some of the other questions to the panel as well. We'll try and do two or three rounds of questions. So, um, Stephen, let's go to you first this time. Um, thanks. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll probably take Mandy's question on, on co-production, because I think that's a really interesting area. And I, and I think, um, you know, I didn't mention it in my opening comments. Um, I think co-production, you know, has to be about bringing together the perspectives and interests of a range of stakeholders. So I think, you know, the question was, how do you stop, um, you know, a particular viewpoint dominating? Well, I think that's that's part of the role of researchers is, you know, is to take the views of stakeholders to convert those into researchable questions. Um, and that's probably, you know, really important skill that researchers bring to the debate around uh, around co-production and then having to turn them into researchable questions, you know, design, you know, support people in designing appropriate um, investigations to answer those those questions. And I think if you go through that kind of process in a staged way, then it should be possible to um, to make sure that the research that comes out of co-production is itself robust um, and and not kind of skewed in in any particular direction. So I think for me, it's about that stage process and building bringing together the skills that that different actors in that co-production have. Thank you, uh, uh, Vicky. Thanks, Nick. Um, so. I suppose maybe starting with Sarah's question, which was about the, the arts-based and the non-conventional uh, methods to influence policy. Um, I, I think actually I'd, I'd signpost an excellent HEPI report uh, that you published recently, and perhaps we could put the link in the chat, which was how to talk to policymakers about research, because I think there's some very useful practical, and Nick's showing it to the screen, I think there's some very useful practical points there. Um, we also did a working paper a couple of years ago about publicly engaged humanities, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from the evolution of museums and galleries in terms of how they curate knowledge and how they present that knowledge to um, inform local communities and influence policymaking there. Um, I, I would also echo Stephen's comments and, and what Tracy has said about thinking very carefully about the research design and possible outcomes of that process and thinking about that testable research question. Um, perhaps if I could pick off uh, Martin's uh, question. So this was about executive summaries and, and helping policymakers and others engage with uh, volume of material. Um, this is something we're thinking a lot about, and we've had a lot of discussion today about syntheses. Um, we're certainly doing a lot in terms of plain language summaries and practitioner abstracts and key policy highlights. So that's one mechanism that we're trying to use to help to boil down that huge volume of research literature into something that is accessible and engageable. I think we do have more to go, um, and I think we we are considering a lot about you know how best do we present that information and where do we present that information. Um, so watch this space. Uh, more to come on our side. Thank you, Vicky. Sometimes when I make that point to policymakers, oh, sorry, to um, researchers, they say actually policymakers should jolly well meet us halfway. Sometimes complex language is necessary. Sometimes research is is complicated and policymakers should meet us halfway is, is that fair tracy or, or or should we always be go to the policymakers 
I think that's also something that policymakers need to do to assure themselves that they're talking to the right people for the question that they've got um, and that it meets the standard that that they need to to put the weight on it they want to put on it so I think you know in terms of um, self-preservation you need people who understand the nature of of research in in some um, you know rather general way um, I I think the uh, there's a there's a kind of job to be done in that conversation, isn't there, though, Nick, where where you have the two together, which is to unpack the question, because I'll take a very simple example of this. The public asks, why haven't we cured cancer yet? Right now, that from a research point of view is many different questions, some of which involve things like motivation and funding of the health system, as well as, you know, uh, how do we get kidneys to cope with carboplatin? Um, you know, th there's a whole bunch of questions there. So I think helping people, un people to unpack a question as it appears in society uh, is a really important skill and that both sides need to apply themselves to. Um, when we, there was sort of question part, also I wanted to pick up from what Martin was asking. Um, I think also we need to think about those questions that are actually abroad as we're doing pieces of research. So, you know, you might be focusing in on something really specific to do with batteries but you need to look at the fact that there's a there's a research promise to have a certain number of new cars manufactured as electric cars and so therefore can we make that that jump and there's not some other questions involved in that and i think there's a lack of awareness sometimes on the part of research that's coming in as to what the questions are that are already in circulation we open evidence week in parliament um, and others could replicate this easily with questions from the public to the mps and then the mps turn to we have the national, the national statistician there and we have the research uh, base represented they turn to them for help in answering uh, and that's a very good three-way conversation that goes on. Um, and I think it's we, we, we'd refer to it as public-led expert fed, um, just to kind of remind ourselves that we need to look at the question as it's appearing to people uh, in society at the moment, and that we might have one part of that to contribute an answer to. Thank you, Tracy. I'm going to go to Sarah, and then I'm going to go back out for more questions. Sarah. Thanks, Nick. Thanks all. I mean, those are really interesting questions. So thank you to you all for raising them. I'm going to start with Martin. So, I mean, in a word, yes, I would love it if every single piece of published research was accompanied by a plain English summary of the kind that Vicky was talking about. Um, and I think we are getting there. I think it's also important to remember that even having plain English summaries doesn't make it easy to assimilate the huge volume of information we've talked about. Um, so I am going to go back to evidence synthesis a bit boringly, but I'm going to point out that we've all talked about it as if it's not necessarily a, a magic bullet, but certainly a, a bit of a component of a magic bullet. Um, it's not necessarily an evidence synthesis paper isn't necessarily comprehensible in itself. So I think we do need to be thinking about even when we've got that synthesis and even when we've got the sort of the collation or the curation of knowledge, how we actually present it in that accessible way. Um, and just to respond to your challenge, Nick, I think, of course, research is complex. Public policy is complex. You know, societal challenges are complex. Don't think that means you have to use complicated language. I think if we want to be good at this, we can use simple language to express complex um, concepts. Um, and the other thing, of course, is I don't think it's enough to just put out executive summaries or, or digestible summaries of research. I think that does take us to the importance, really, of, of dialogue and of relational approaches and of interpersonal interaction, which I think is where Mandy's question comes in around co-production. Um, and I think you're right to raise the potential dangers of that approach, but I, I agree really with what Stephen said. It's about bringing different perspectives together and recognising the validity of those different perspectives and recognising that collectively they might help to illuminate a question in a way that is, is much harder if you're doing it from a single perspective. So I think it does require a bit of open mindedness. Um, it can often require, I think, quite a lot of deep, extensive working um, to, I suppose, to apply the methodologies that will enable people to, to come to the position of being ready to work in that way. Um, and there's lots we can learn from other sectors, I think, like community engagement work that goes on is really, really good at how to do co-production meaningfully and respectfully and inclusively. So I think there's, there's already a lot of good practice that we can draw on. Um, 
we've actually been running workshops at UCL with um, the co-production collective here on how to do good co-production in a policy context, which is, is really interesting, but not necessarily straightforward. And then I think, oh, sorry. sorry, just to address, address Sarah's question very briefly. Um, I sort of want to say that I think non-conventional methods are really good at opening up and doing some of the unpacking that Tracy talked about. So I would I would use that as, as your way in. Can you look at a question differently? But I would also not worry too much about the methods. I would worry much more about how you're building the links and the context that then enable you to go and talk about your research to whoever it is that you want to reach. Sorry, Nick. Thank you, Sarah. Fantastic. I'm, I'm keen to get one more uh, round of questions in. So. Um, thank you for all those answers. I, the, the, the most popular, um, oh, sorry, one of the one of the uh, questions we've got in from an anonymous person it's in the Q and A is the success of open access and ensuring knowledge mobilisation might depend on how the journal's content is advertised and visible to policymakers and the broader public or science communicators. Do you think it's something the journals publishers? could do more to advertise what they publish and reach the right audience. So we might look particularly to Vicky to uh, to answer that. Uh, the most popular question we've had in is from Helen Young. So Helen, can we turn on, uh, let's see if we can turn on Helen's microphone and get Helen to put her question direct. Helen, do say where you're from and put, put your question. Thanks, Nick. Um, Helen Young, I'm a research policy manager at the uh, University of Strathclyde. I was just obviously maybe picking up on Stephen's mention of research culture there um, to, to kind of just, you know, um, address that key question we all have is how do we actually make collaboration inclusive? How do we kind of really be honest about the power dynamics in the sector and the, and the kind of that real balance that there always is between competition between institutions, but the desire to collaborate for the greater good. And I think for me, it's about being really, really brutally honest about that sometimes and bringing into conversation and recognizing what net, the networks, who they're missing out, where there might not be resource. How do we make sure that the less research intensives, and that's not Strathclyde, by the way, but how can the less research intensives be brought to the table in a way that is manageable for them? Because they won't have time to translate sometimes. Uh, thank you, uh, Helen, very much. And I'm going to put one more anonymous question that's popped in. Um, which says, would providing researchers training about evidence-based science communication help bridge the distance between academic research and policy? If so, could publishers and bodies such as Sense About Science, Tracy's here, help promote awareness leading up to the integration of such training with university courses stroke research methodology? So a question about uh, wh whether academics need uh, some some training in this area. So uh, I'm going to go back to the panelists now for their uh, response to those questions and also any final comments they would like uh, to make that haven't already been uh, made. And this time I'm going to go Tracy to you first. Right, thanks. I'm, I'm actually going to leave that question about inclus inclusion to Sarah because I know she's really exercised about um, including um, universities that don't have the the same kind of capacity. Essentially, um, the I think there is room for training, um, but I do think that paying attention to the to the actual wider discussion, uh, there's no there's no shortcut to that it's really important to actually look at what's gone before in this discussion what's coming over the hill um, and to you know to embrace a bit of that in thinking about where your research lands and what part of uh, that questioning uh, it contributes to so I think that's something that we find you know so uh, you know I'll, I'll speak bluntly when we talk to researchers preparing for something like evidence week and they've got to be able to talk for three minutes about their work what they first try to do is they try to compact it all down into a three minute spiel and they speak even more quickly than I speak uh, to try and cover that and what we end up doing is we pull it all apart and we say, you know, which which bit of this really connects with with the question that's going to confront policymakers? What's this going to turn on? Um, and sort of pull pull the other layers apart. And then we say, okay. And then what can we tell them about how confident you are in this knowledge and what more needs to be done? And we go back out from that small bit to a bigger picture. And I think that is um, a very important insight that people get from from the experience. But I do think doing it is one of the, the best ways of understanding what's needed. Um, and I don't think that we necessarily want to start investing in 
training right across the research base that only some people will use sometimes uh, and it would be ultimately a very small percentage of them it's much more important to look at where the conversation is happening and suck in what's needed from there and that's why I'm so emphatic about the brief the wider infrastructure and libraries and others the house of commons librarian and the librarians that exist in 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 um, uh, every legislature are incredibly important guides <clears throat> to doing that I think publishers have got better at saying this is what we know and signpost it through the experience of the pandemic um, but the signposting and the sort of sucking in this how do I find who's got answers to this stuff um, is really what you know we need to invest more in uh, uh, thank you Tracy that was a lovely segue to Sarah you did my job for me there brilliantly so Sarah do you want to take on Helen's question thanks yeah I'm really glad you asked that Helen um as as Tracy says it is a question dear to my heart um I'm going to start just by plugging UPenn which I know Strathclyde is, is a member university of UPenn is the university policy engagement network and one of the reasons it exists is really a recognition of what you're talking about that we have a real diversity of institutions across the UK and that we're much more effective if we can share knowledge but also work together um so UPenn is is really trying I suppose to bring in out the different kinds of institutions that we have but recognize some of what you're talking about in terms of the power dynamics um i think we should also just reflect on the fact that we're much more effective doing this when we collaborate most policy audiences are, don't really want universities to be competing over each other um, to get their attention they just want to know what it is that they need to know so i do think there's a real strategic or tactical advantage for the sector if we actually get behind collaborating there's also, I think, a real question of just the, the quality, um, which Tracy has already raised. Um, and if we think about this from the policy side, and if policymakers are only talking to their usual suspects, then actually they're missing a huge swathe of body and evidence. So I think there are really strong incentives, actually, when you stop to think about it, for us to tackle some of those power dynamics you're talking about and think about what's needed. Um, somebody else has raised in the question as well, the, the, quest, the role of universities, I suppose, in, in promoting inclusivity um, in the work that they can do. So getting their local communities more involved in considering policy questions. And I think that's another really important dimension of this. How do you bring together citizen engagement and academic evidence and policy priorities? Um, I think... One of the things we've been doing through CAPE is looking, which is funded by Research England, I should say, um, is looking at what it looks, what academic policy engagement looks like in different institutional and policy contexts. And the institutional context and structures really matter. Um, I don't think there is a, a right or wrong way to do it, but I think you do have to be very alert to the particular kind of resources and the particular levers you have in your given context. Which takes me really to a final comment, if you'll permit, Nick, which is I think we need to think much more seriously about investing in these sorts of structures and in the connective infrastructure that underpins all this. Um, so for me, that means investing in knowledge mobilizers, but it also means investing in the research community and providing the incentives for researchers to spend time working to engage with public policy. It's not easy. Most people do it as a, as a side concern. They do it because they're interested. And if we want to think about equity and the power dynamics that Helen has talked about, then we need to embed it and recognize it much more in the academic endeavor. Thank you, Sarah. I I'm going to go to Stephen next. And Stephen, can I just slip in one other issue as well which is if all the things we've heard about today were to happen and we were to do all this stuff even better than uh, it is already done would it make your job at research england part of ukri in talking to policymakers about making sure there's decent funding for research easier you know is this is this a partly about funding as well as about actually um furthering knowledge yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll try and address that alongside the, the other. So, you know, I think I try and pull together two of the questions and around, um, you know, really the, the question about discoverability of either research, which is the, the question, you know, from uh, the anonymous question about visibility of journal content and discoverability of researchers, which I think is at the kind of heart of this question about, about um, you know, different types of university and, and so on. And I think I think we do have a, a problem in that policymakers tend to shortcut their route to quality through using reputational signals like the university that someone comes from. And so it becomes much harder for experts, I think, from universities that are less 
uh, you know, have lower reputations or are less well known um, to really engage in the process. And this is a real shame because you know, what the policymaker needs is the real deep expert in the question that they want to address. And that expert might come from any one of, uh, you know, 150 or so really excellent universities in the UK, not just the kind of short list of four or five that, that a policymaker might come to. So I think that is a real challenge to, to address there. And I think the, the collaboration point is really important here that, um, that, you know, I'm just really agreeing with what Sarah said, that, that universities really need to work together in this space to, you know, assemble the best experts um, and the best expert knowledge um, and, and provide that to policymakers and not do that in a competitive way. And I think, you know, from, from the point of view of, of Research England and the, the National Research Assessment, we need to think about the, the kind of dynamics that that assessment creates in terms of competition between institutions and find ways that we can um that we can uh you know help support that collaboration you know on the the training question you know and there's no doubt that training is important um and valuable um but i think you know it's a bit like like saying you know is open access the solution to to you know get, getting better evidence informed policy making well no you need other things is training the solution well no it's part of the mix and and uh, and needs to be in, included but it's not a kind of magic bullet and you know the, one of the problems with with training initiatives in all sorts of spheres including this one is that unless you know i don't think i don't think it's good to make training training mandatory but if you if it's not mandatory the people who vote with their feet for the training are often the people who need the least help and support and actually the the people who really need the help and support don't actually take up the training so i think i think it's important to look at those dynamics and and i think you know i i, I would uh, caution viewing training as a, as a magic bullet um on to your question nick you know is 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 uh, the um the um you know, is there a barrier? Is this barrier important in terms of research funding? I think absolutely it is, um, because I think, um, you know, across government, I don't think people always see the value of investment in research in the context of their policy making, because it can be so difficult for them to access um, the kinds of insight they need in their policy making work. So I, so I do think. If we could get better at um, building the linkages between uh, academic research and policy making, which you know we're all, everyone who's on this call is kind of committed to doing things in their space that help to do that, then I think that would help us make the case for investment in research, definitely. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to turn to Vicky for uh, the final word before we before we wind up. Vicky. Thank you, Nick. Uh... Um, such a great discussion. So I'll, I'll pick off, if I may, actually, the, the, the question around training, because I think this is a really interesting one. And there are perhaps three points that um, to make here to, to echo what the other speakers have said. I, th I think certainly training is something we do already. Tracy's talked about um, Evidence Week. We, we've supported that for a number of years. And I think there's a lot to be said about the, the research design. Um, so really, again, thinking about, OK, who, who might be the benefic beneficiaries of the outcome of this research process? and what is it that they want to hear. Um, certainly, whenever we engage with policymakers, that is the, the question that they put to us. You know, why should we care about this? And I have an interesting anecdotal example about green infrastructure, talking about that to the local MP. He sat up and took notice when we related that to potential savings in terms of, of um, healthcare um, by providing that green therapy in those green spaces. Um, I would do wonder as well if there's perhaps some training or awareness raising for policymakers, and and the focus there would be about the the people and the networks that they interact with. Again, a challenge that we've heard about is we we interact with a lot of early career academics who are not able to break into these networks because there are such uh, entrenched links between uh, policymakers and their sort of go to people. So I think there's something there about trying to think about how policymakers themselves could amplify their networks. Um, but perhaps just to, to note that, the, as Stephen mentioned, this whole ecosystem is very complex. It's iterative. There is not a linear link between doing a piece of research and that having a policy impact. So I think we also need to be um, very cautious about that. And um, I suppose if I go back to my opening um, 
point about mindset, I think this is about conversation, it's about dialogue, it's about people as well as content. Um, very briefly on the um, the, the display of information and, and how general co content is promoted. We certainly know that open access content on our platform gets about 10 times more usage than um, subscription based content. So that's a compelling and powerful signal for us. But we also know that we need to be doing more to engage with folks on social media platforms and thinking about that. Um, there is the obvious challenge there in terms of disinformation, misinformation. So how do we signal that this content is trustable, reliable, um, something that we're thinking a lot about? Thank you, uh, Vicky, and thank you to all the speakers, both for uh, your wide ranging thoughts and, and for keeping to time. I'm really pleased how much we've managed to cover in our hour. We've recorded the session, so do encourage people to watch it back or watch it back yourselves. Uh, and we've also captured the questions that we weren't able to get to. I, I just want to end by making two points. Uh, apart from thanking all our speakers for giving up their time and being so thought provoking uh, and also my colleague Emma who's sitting behind the scenes making sure all the tech works um, uh, 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 as well as the, uh, other members of the happy team um, I just want to flag that our next big event on research is on the 1st of March we've got a, 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 a research conference um, where we've got a, 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 you know, people from across the research community speaking details are on our website first of march still nearly a week nearly a month to go um so let me draw your attention to that as well as lots of other events we've got coming up so i'm going to pause there because i know people have very busy days i know we could go on talking about this for a lot longer um thank you all for listening in we'd like to keep this debate going on the happy blog through happy publications through upper he other happy outputs so do please continue to engage with us um, and thanks again to all our speakers and to all of you for listening in. Thank you and goodbye.